Buongiorno, io sono Luca Dondoni, sono un ex alunno del Collegio Chisieri, mi sono laureato nel 2019 in filosofia e ora svolgo ricerca presso il King's College di Londra. Oggi vi presento il mio secondo intervento per la serie Non fermiamo la cultura del Collegio Chisieri e innanzitutto colgo l'occasione per ringraziare il Collegio per avermi dato la possibilità di presentare nuovamente il mio lavoro come parte di questa importante iniziativa. Con il primo intervento abbiamo parlato di filosofia presocratica della mente e oggi ci occuperemo di ontologie presocratiche. Ma prima di iniziare una specificazione. Visto che le slides che utilizzerò durante la mia presentazione, il paper originale su cui questa è basata, sono entrambe in lingua inglese, ho deciso di svolgere l'intera presentazione in lingua inglese. Bene, cominciamo. So today uh, we will be discussing presocratic ontologies, some of the major presocratic ontologies, and I will make a case for what I call the possibility of infinite descent or infinite divisibility. So let's take a look at the objectives of my paper. So first, theoretical objective will be to show that a reformulated version, a refined version of Zeno's argument against morality, also known as argument a might lend support to the view that there is no hand to the words complexity, so that there is no such thing as bottom level physical reality. Another course connected uh, objective of historical inter interpretative nature would be to show um, that both the major presocratic ontologies, which I will take into consideration, namely Eleaticism and pluralism, are equally affected by. Zeno's argument against plurality and by my refined version of the argument, and that this is due to a presupposed claim that this both, the both ontologies um, share. And also I will highlight how these two main Kosukatic ontologies uh, cannot get away that easily from the consequences of the argument. So let's now turn to the structure of my of my talk and of my paper. So we'll first introduce and sketch out the two major presocratic ontologies. I will not go into much details about the various variations of pluralism, um, but I will then introduce Zeno's uh, Zeno of Elea's argument A, argument against plurality, uh, explain the reasoning behind the premises and um, sketch out the conclusion. And then I will reformulate the argument. I will build my own argument, which I shall call argument for infinite descent on the basis of Zeno's argument and see how this can impact on the presocratic uh, metaphysic in general. Um, I will specifically argue that this will impact negatively, negatively on both pluralism and eleaticism. I will then focus on eleaticism and try and imagine how the eleatic advocate might counter my argument, my object to my argument. So this fourth section, the Eleatic lines of defense. Um, I will then argue that the Eleatic cannot really object, refute my argument. So we're stuck with infinite descent. We better embrace infinite descent, but as I will contend, this is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, at the end, I will draw some concluding remarks um, also pointing at the contemporary reflection on infinite descent in metaphysics and uh, a bit in philosophy of mind. So let's begin. So pre-Socratic ontologies. So there is no controversy among scholars over the fact that the Parmenidean metaphysical, epistemological, and meta-theoretical question, questions mark a turning point or better a point of no return for pre-Socratic philosophy. And accordingly, scholarship is quite united in claiming that philosophers such as Empedocles, Anaxagoras, and the Atomist may be grouped together under the label of post parmenidean thinkers. And this not, not just for chronological reasons. So the Eleatic metaphysics question the common sense belief in the world as it appears to us. And thus the post parmenidean systems are designed to take account of the radical challenges that the Eleatic posed, as KRS say. In Plato's Parmenides, 
the Eleatic is shown as advocating the modest view that there is a one. Uh, that is the thesis that only one thing or item exists. And after Parmenides, Greek philosophers elaborated various different metaphysical accounts of reality, such as pluralism, atomism, and Plato's theory of forms. But the element that, that all their views share is, they, is that they all posit a numerical plurality of fundamental entities, as Kurt said. And thus, in this sense, they all qualify as pluralist theories of reality. So let's, uh, let's take a closer look to the Parmenidean metaphysical proposal. So as I really suggest, Parmenides considers the world of our ordinary experience non-existent and our normal beliefs in the existence of change, plurality, and even our own selves to be entirely deceptive. Thus, Parmenides believed in two mutually exclusive categories, being and non-being. And the possibility of any interaction between these two poles is strictly rejected. Now, being constitutes for Parmenides the only true and genuinely existing substance, and it provides a number of qualifications to characterize this being. So I'm here particularly uh, concerned, interested, in the spatial connotation of the being uh, that are continuous, indivisible, and unique. So if we conceive of being as spatially interrupted by something, then we would admit the existence of non-being, as positing an interruption of being would mean that there is something that is not being. And as we know, not being, non-being is impossible and inconceivable. Being is thus indivisible, continuous, and one. And this also entails that void does not exist, as it would be an interruption of being. And as we know, that being and non-being and are the only ontological categories admitted, void would be non-being. But non-being is impossible and conceivable. Thus, void is impossible and inconceivable. And this also applies for, to change. Being, then, must be homogeneous and undifferentiated. So there are two last characterizations of uh, being, of what is, that need to be addressed, namely perfect and complete. Now it follows from uh, it being immovable and unchanging that what is, the one being, remains the same in the same place, it rests by itself and so remains firmly where it is. What is thus remains within its bounds, complete, and plenum in itself. So these last characterizations of what is are exemplified, let's say, explained by the form of a well-rounded sphere. The being is uniform, symmetrical, equal in all directions, and whole in all respects. So now, the circulation of Parmenides' poem had a disruptive effect on the Greek philosophical milieu, and a clear, clear sign of this the works of his immediate successors, who endeavored to either counter or defend the Eleatic conclusion. So this is just to say that no mid-fifth century Greek philosopher seems to have been entirely indifferent towards the Parmenidean challenge. So if we follow Coxon, we can individuate two main kinds of responses to the Parmenidean arguments, which together encompass the whole ontological speculation of the middle fifth century. So on the one hand, there are those who struggle to avoid the Eleatic conclusions about the nature of being, attempting to re-establish the reality of the sensible world by constructing it out of an infinite plurality of non-sensible forms. And each of these forms, each of which are given some qualifications of the Eleatic real substance. And on the other hand, there are those who provided an account of sensible reality by constructing it from the aggregation and combination of four sensible elements or roots. Now to the first group belong Leuchippus and Anaxagoras, whereas to the second Empedocles. So I don't really need for the purposes of my paper to uh, go too much into detail about the various pluralist 
proposals. We can just say that the post-Parmenidean thinkers of the mid fifth century all either endorsed Parmenides' fundamental doctrine, that is the rejection of the possibility of existential change, or at least endeavored to elaborate views which could partly, at least partly meet the Eleatic demands for changelessness. Now, however, while attempting to both respect the Eleatic canon and at the same time account for the differentiated sensible entities as not entirely deceptive, the pluralist renounced Parmenides' monist ontology and posited a plurality of real substances or basic entities, be them roots as in Empedocles, atoms as in Leuchippus, or seeds as in Anaxagoras. So I think all, all things considered then, from a metaphysical point of view, the connection between the Eleatics and the pluralists and the atomists in particular, which Burnett deemed the most important point in the history of Greek philosophy, may essentially be seen as a movement from a metaphysics of one to a metaphysics of many. Now, it is worth stressing, though, that while changing the number of the fundamental entities, the pluralists seem to have maintained the overall structure of the Eleatic metaphysical proposal untouched. That is, the claim that there is a fundamental level of reality and that it is composed of genuine, real, indivisible, unchanging substance. So in this direction, I submit that both the Eleatic doctrine and the different pluralist metaphysics all qualify essentially as fundamentalist theories of reality, as they all maintain that there is a fundamental level of reality at which there reside some entities, all the sensible objects of the world are constituted by, composed of, supervenient upon, realized by, or governed by. So the mid fifth century ontological and cosmological speculation actually was not exhausted by the works of those who endeavored to you know, overcome the Parmenidean challenge, namely Empedocles and Axagoras and Leuchippus. Indeed, two philosophers, namely Zeno of Leia and Melissus of Samos, not only seem to have accepted Parmenides, the, the Parmenides philosophy, but they even attempted to further the Eleatic project and highlight that its consequences were in fact even more radical than they already appeared. Now, specifically, Zeno of Elea, we are told by Plato in the Parmenides, was chiefly concerned with the nature of the sensible world. In particular, Plato specifies that he was engaged in the project of demonstrating that even more absurd consequences follow from the pluralist thesis that there are many. So let's take a look at Zeno's main argument against the existence of many as it is found in fragments 29b1 and 29 So here's the argument. Let's now try and reconstruct the Zeno's reasoning that lies behind the premises and the conclusion. So premise one establishes that if many exist, then everything that is extended, that is the cosmos, would ultimately consist of individual particles, which would in turn be units. So I must say here uh, that in my presentation and also my paper, I take the properties of being extended, having size, and having magnitude as equivalent and interchangeable, and as all referring to the notion of greatness, megatons. So now, however, each of the resultant unities cannot have themselves parts, as this would be, as Frankel said, incompatible with the character of the whole as a single thing and a unity. Now, as Kurt points out, this is explained by Simplicius in his reference, the Mystius, according to whom Zeno's argument establishes that what is or the one is a unity because it is indivisible and continuous for division entails plurality. Now, it follows then that the only way in which the units which we ultimately come down to from the process of division may be indivisible units is if these units have no magnitude. Now, premise two moves, of course, from the results 
achieved by premise one, who claims that if the ultimate units have no magnitude, they do not even exist. So the argument here feels quite puzzling. Um, as if taken as face value, it seems to amount to kind of triviality as a last resort. So Zeno claims that when we add the thing with no magnitude to another thing, this will not make the second any greater. So the natural conclusion seems thus to be that adding or subtracting a thing with no magnitude will not result in an increase or decrease. So the point of the argument seems thus to I mean, the argument seems that to demonstrate that a thing with no magnitude, that is an, an unextended thing, is nothing. However, as is manifest, the ultimate conclusion to which Zeno wants to come down to is that a thing that has no magnitude, that is nothing, uh, do, does not exist. Where nothingness and non-existence and the relevant predicates is nothing and is not are treated as identical. And here, Blasters follows Frankel and claims that Zeno read would be nothing as equivalent to would not exist due to his strict adherence to the Eleatic canon and quotes Parmenides for under 45e. Now, premise three follows directly from the previous one and claims that as we moved from the assumption that many do exist they must have magnitude. That is, they are indeed extended. So one might, might, might read this with Franklin and claim that the move is justified on the basis of Zeno's belief about the equivalence and the identity between existence and, um, and magnitude. So given the, that the, unity, the units exist, they have magnitude. Further, considering that if a thing is a part of some whole and it must be of the same nature of the whole as Perley states. If the whole is extended and divisible, then the parts of the whole must be extended and divisible. And therefore, the units resulting from the division of the original unit, they each have infinite magnitude and infinitely divisible nature, as does the original unit. So, Right, from the premises, it follows conclusion four that the units resultant from the division of the original unit would have at the same time no magnitude as per premise one and infinite magnitude as per premise three. And this is an open and clear contradiction. So, so much for Zeno's argument A. And, and so the argument shows that if we posit plurality, uh, numerical plurality of entities, we end up with um, a contradiction. So the argument defeats the pluralist metaphysics. However, some scholars, such as Blasters and Kurt, suggested that Zeno's argument may lead to some conclusions that go beyond the original purpose for which it was primarily designed. That is, rejecting the possibility of the existence of many, and defending the metaphysical consistency of the Eleatic one. And specifically, as Furley states in a footnote that you can read on the slide, Zeno's argument main achievement may be that it, it has proved infinite divisibility. Now, in order to highlight the further conclusions of the argument, let me now elaborate on Furley's suggestion and build a modified version of Zeno's argument A, argument against plurality, which I shall call argument for infinite descent. So this is the argument and let's proceed to the discussion of the premises. And then I will finally assess the impact, evaluate the impact that the argument might exert on the Eleatic and pluralist metaphysics. So let's address the premises one by one. Let us begin with premise one. So the idea that whatever there is, is, it is extended, that is, has magnitude, is certainly not foreign to the uh, early Greek philosophical tradition. And indeed, the Ionian school followers, namely Thales, Anaximander, and Eximenes, advocated the idea that everything was ultimately constituted of, made up of a single kind of matter or stuff. And this view is called material monism. 
Now, the pluralists too seem to have held the view that the fundamental substances, which the sensible entities were made of, made of be them roots, as in Empedocles, atoms, as in Leucippus, seeds, as in Anaxagoras, were extended or had magnitude. Now, the premise too follows from Zeno's argument A, and as already said, claims that the properties of being extended, so having magnitude, and of being indivisible are incompatible. Then from the premises, it follows conclusion three that states that given one true infinite descent, that is the thesis that there is no end to the world's complexity and there is no bottom level physical reality is metaphysically possible. Now, this being said, my conclusion on, on, on the argument is that if conclusion three is, tr is true and the argument is valid, then both eleaticism and pluralism are equally in danger. So as it has already been stressed in, in, the, in the first part of my presentation, eleaticism and pluralism are essentially opposed on the issue of how many fundamental entities there are out there in the world. And thus the movement from eleaticism to pluralism may be seen as a shift from a metaphysics of one to a metaphysics of many. However, both the pluralist and the eleatic agree on the general metaphysical frame that there is a fundamental level of reality. That is a genuine, real, ontological bottom level which all existing entities are composed of, supervenient upon, realized by, or governed by, as Schaffer says. So both eleaticism and pluralism are fundamentalist theories of reality, I argue. Now, as far as the existence of a fundamental base is necessary, is a necessary condition for eleaticism and pluralism to even be on the table, then the argument for infinite descent, my argument, defeats both the options precisely because it establishes that it is a metaphysical possibility that there is no such thing as a, a fundamental layer of reality, uh, an ontological bottom level. Now, in this section, I shall take into consideration, discuss and evaluate, assess some possible counter arguments that the Eleatic may advance in order to refute my argument for infinite descent and thus to defend her own position. I must say before approaching this section that I will focus on the Eleatic because I'm convinced that the objection that the pluralist and in particular the atomist may advance against Zeno's argument against plurality, which is reported by Aristotle and attributed to Democritus, is not really convincing. And also Aristotle made a really good job at debunking it in the very same section of his work. So I will focus on the Eleatic, which is also the most controversial part in the literature. So, as anticipated, the main issue with the Eleatic is whether Zeno's argument against plurality and thus my argument for infinite descent threatens Parmenides and not only pluralists, right? So, and as Kurd remarks, much hangs on whether the Eleatic one is taken to be corporeal or incorporeal. That is, if premise one of my argument is accepted or not by the Parmenidean advocate. And with regards to the issue of corporeality of the Eleatic being, in the literature we can identify two main positions. First of all, Morlatus, Blastus, and mainly Coxon argue that it is not the case that the Eleatic one has magnitude. Thus they reject, in fact, premise one of my argument. Alternatively, Fairley states that what is certainly has magnitude, but as it has no bulk or solidity or thickness, it cannot be divided. Thus, he in effect rejects premise two, claiming that extension is not sufficient for divisibility. So let's now address the possible objections one by one, and we of course begin with Coxon. So Coxon addresses the issue 
of the corporeality of the being in connection with the Parmenidean analogy of the sphere. And in defending the perfection and completeness of the being, the Eleatic argued that what is may be exemplified by the form of a well-rounded sphere. And so the being is uniform, symmetrical, equal in all directions, and whole in all respects. So Coxon, first of all, he holds that Parmenides does not explicitly say that what is is spherical, rather that its perfection is like that of a sphere. And as the sphere was regarded as the most complete and perfect shape of all, it serves as an appropriate analog for the perfection of the being. And secondly, Coxon holds that although Parmenides does not intend to equate the being to a sphere conceived of as a solid figure, the technical use of the analogy is not to be overlooked or underestimated. Indeed, Parmenides' sphere is qualified as equally poised, a characterization that is specifically employed to highlight the balance that holds between the totality of the being and its center. And, and this suggesting that the analogy is intended to shed light on the dynamic equilibrium of the being rather than on its geometrical form. Now, and finally, Coxon states that it is perfectly reasonable to believe that for many this intended the being both without magnitude and without volume. And the reference to the being being equally poised would thus be an allusion to, a, and I quote, an equilibrium and a center which are not those of a physical body. Okay, so much for Coxon, let's move on. So unlike Coxon, Furley states that Parmenides certainly took his one to be one and to have magnitude. And that this is an open contradiction with, the, with his conclusion that size, with Zeno's conclusion that size and indivisibility are incompatible. However, he claims that it seems really, Furley claims that it seems really unlikely that Zeno could have made such a manifest mistake. And thus, but there must be some way to avoid this inconsistency. So Fairley's guess is that Zeno might have adopted the same argumentative line of Melissus and thought that the Eleatic one had magnitude, but no parts, and that the saving feature of his one being was that it lacked bulk or solidity, pathos. So as far as Zeno is concerned, the argument Fairley presents for ease reading is that the word pacus occurs twice in Zeno's argument, as you can see here in the fragments, and unless it served as a specific a specification that magnitude and bulk were not the same or equivalent thing, it would have been, and I quote, a piece of unnecessary rhetoric. So if we buy Fairley's interpretation, then Zeno's re reasoning would be that the problem with the pluralist beings was that they had both magnitude and bulk factor. Well, the Eleatic one, lacking bulk, gave the hypothetical divider no starting point to operate her division. Now, Fairley's point is that Xenon may have used the term packers as a compendious expression to indicate a set of properties borne by the Eleatic one and not by the pluralist being, such as being all alike, being not at all more in any way, etc. And the lack of these properties would indicate that the pluralist beings allow for differentiation and are divisible, while the Eleatic one does not admit any differentiation of any sort. And further support to the thesis that the Eleatic one, even though it may have had magnitude, does not have solidity, may come from Melissus' explicit remark that you can find here in the slide, that if it is to be, it must be one, and being one, it must not have a body. If it had density pockets, it would have parts and would no longer be one. So Melissa su suggests that material density or solidity pockets, thickness, whatever, is a property of a physical, of physical body, soma, which is divisible. 
where the non-bodily substance of the being is not divisible. Now, if we go with Furley and accept that Zeno did in fact endorse the conception of the being proposed by Melissus, then we can say that the term Oko is indeed connected with the notion of magnitude megaton, and that this does indeed suggest that the Eleatic one is extended. However, in order for a being to be divisible, it must have a body, soma, where the main characteristic of a, of a physical body is to have solidity, pacos, which the Eleatic one, of course, lacks. Now, these are the strategies, brief summary of the strategies. Let's, let's take a step back and try and assess, evaluate the two strategies. And of course, let's begin with, with Coxon's proposal. Then with regards to the view that the Eleatic one is not extended, so it has no magnitude, I believe we should treat, we should consider two different orders of reasons. So from a textual point of view, it ought to be noted that Parmenides use of the term or volume to characterize the sphere in the context of his analogy may shed light on the fact that he may have conceived of the sphere as something more than a stereometrical object. And accordingly, the term orco is connected with Zeno's concepts of magnitude, megatos, and density factors. And in general, it indicates a peculiar characteristic of physical substances. So I believe we can safely infer that when describing the being, Parmenides had in mind that physical sphere. And Coxon himself admits to this to some extent. Now, secondly, from a more theoretical point of view, so if we considered, if we truly considered the thesis that Coxon is supporting here, that is, that Zeno thought that the one was not extended, then we would end up with quite an unfair picture of Zeno of the Eleatic philosopher. Indeed, the view of the one not having magnitude, uh, magnitude is in direct tension with the cornerstone of Zeno's own argument. That is, that if a thing has no magnitude, is a nothing, then it does not exist. So I will here follow Furley and Blasters and believe that we should adopt a charitable attitude towards the Eleatic philosopher. And let's assume that he would have noticed such a manifest contradiction, such a manifest mistake. So all things considered, given the explicit analogy of the being, of the one being like a physical sphere and a charitable attitude towards Zeno, I believe we have reasons, maybe good reasons, of course not conclusive reasons, to hold that he conceived of the one as having magnitude. Now, Furley too takes into consideration the association of the term Horco volume with the notions of magnitude, megatos, and density factors in Zeno's argument. However, contra Coxon, Furley argues that the two latter properties, so having magnitude and having solidity, bulk, thickness, or density, are separate and that Parmenides attributes to the being only the first and not the second one, thus saving the one from infinite divisibility. So this strategy is supposed to refute my argument as it establishes that mere extension is not sufficient for divisibility, thus in fact denying premise two of my argument for infinite descent. So this being said, I believe there are a few issues with Furley's reading, both from an historical point of view from, and from a purely theoretical standpoint. So first of all, it is debatable, highly debatable, whether Zeno did actually follow Melissus in conceiving of the being as not having solidity. And indeed, Raven, for example, denies the validity of any comparison between Zeno and Melissus and argues that while Zeno was mainly concerned with refuting pluralism, so a destructive a destructive approach, Melissus attempted to argue constructively about the Eleatic one. Secondly, even if the comparison were valid, this would lead to a conception of the being as neither full nor 
void as if it were void, it would be nothing as per Zeno's argument. And it is hardly possible that Melissus did in fact develop such an idea of the incorporeal being as Booth says against Blaster. Now in Booth, in Booth's direction, also Guthrie remarks that the notion of the incorporeality of the being was not yet achieved with Melissus. And accordingly, Giovanni Reale states that those who interpret Melissus one as immaterial, that is incorporeal, make the serious mistake of employing some later categories in the reading of a philosopher who is still a pro-Socratic to the bones. Categories which would be achieved only with Plato and then established with Aristotle. Now, the point seems to be that the Leatics were trying to provide an account of reality as intelligible and unchangeable along the lines of what then could be Platonic or Aristotelian metaphysics without renouncing the Parmenidean strict monism. That is without accepting the existence or of say two separate levels of reality. Now, let us accept just for the sake of argument that Zeno and Melissus did have some notion of the incorporeal being conceived of as something that is some way extended, but has no solidity. So from a purely theoretical standpoint, one might wonder what would be like for an entity to instantiate the property of extension and not the one of solidity. That is, whether it is really the case that there are some entities that are extended but not solid. And specifically, one might be tempted to say that the only entities that are extended but not solid are those that fall in the category of either points, strings, and planes, or of stereometrical objects, provided that, of course, as Plato's forms are not even an option. However, if this were the case, that is, if being fell into the same category of points and strings and so on, it is really not clear what would be the factual di metaphysical difference with the proposal that the being is not corporeal nor extended at all. And secondly, if being were a geometrical solid, then we would be presented with the same Cartesian problem of having to account for the causal relationship between a fundamental non-solid entity and a non-fundamental solid world. So now let's just very briefly sum up um, the strategies. So we have considered two different strategies that the advocate of the Iliatic monism may put in place to counter object to my argument. The first strategy has been to deny premise one, claiming that the one is not extended, and this has failed as it can be identified some textual association between volume and magnitude that suggests the contrary. On the other hand, the second strategy, has been, which has been inspired by Furley, um, consisted in denying premise two. And specifically, the strategy was to make less relaxed the conditions for divisibility, and in particular to require for divisibility not only the property of magnitude, megatos, but also the property of solidity, pactos, to be instantiated. And in this respect, I've shown that Furley's strategy, which elaborates on an alleged comparison between Zeno and Melissus moves, really moves on thin ice, even from a purely historical point of view. Further, the question has been raised whether we can actually conceive of an extended yet non-solid, not solid entity as constituting the fundamental layer of physical reality, provided that anything even resembling Plato's forms is entirely off the table. So we have seen that the advocates of the two major pre-Socratic ontologies cannot really provide conclusive reasons against the possi metaphysical possibility of infinite descent. So it seems that infinite descent, the, the, the metaphysical possibility that there is no hand towards complexity is here to stay. So we'd better embrace it. And I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. So in this concluding part, I shall gesture towards some possible accounts of physical reality which may be compatible with infinite divisibility. And something along the lines 
of the conclusions that I reach with my argument for infinite descent has been advocated, or at least discussed by a number of metaphysicians in contemporary times, in relatively recent times. Now, for instance, here, that Sider claimed that following to scientific discovery that hydrogen atoms had proper parts and then also protons had proper parts. At a certain point, it was a legitimate scientific hypothesis that this process could go on forever. And it then states that it is not desirable that philosophical speculation leads to the design of a metaphysical system in which what is held to be a legitimate scientific hypothesis is regarded as metaphysically impossible. And thus he claimed we should value the option of possible words made of atomless gunk, uses this term following David Lewis, and atomless gunk that is simply stuff that has no meriological atoms as parts. So as is clear, if gunk words are possible, then the properties of being extended and being indivisible are at least in those words incompatible. So along with Sider, also David Armstrong discusses the idea that everything is molecular, this, that there are only complex properties all the way down. And he wonders whether there are good reasons to believe in simples rather than just in structures of structures of structures ad infinitum. And he further suggests that adopting a doctrine that presupposes simples leaves no room for, and I quote, even the possibility of infinite complexity wouldn't be such a clever move from a metaphysical point of view. So I believe from Seidel and Armstrong's remarks, we may thus draw some final conclusions on infinite descent. So first of all, Infinite descent treated as a working hypothesis highlights the need for a change of attitude. Metaphysicians simply shouldn't accept fundamentality as a primitive, unquestionable feature of physical reality. Much to the contrary, philosophers ought to design systems which can accommodate infinite divisibility as a serious metaphysical possibility. Now, secondly, Infinite descent implies that all entities are macro entities. That is, that all things that exist are composite. But this does not entail that they are in any sense less real, less genuine. Rather, infinite descent yields a strikingly, and I quote, egalitarian metaphysic, which dignifies and empowers the whole nature. That is a metaphysics where no level is special, as Schaffer said. So we've reached the end of the paper and also of presentation. Let's draw very quickly some final conclusions. So Zeno's argument A, Zeno's argument against plurality works against pluralism because it denies basically metaphysical fundamentalism. And for the very same reason, given that both eleaticism and pluralism are fundamentalist theories of reality, as I contended, Zeno's argument uh, backfires. So in order to further and clarify these reasons, and the possible consequences of the argument, I elaborated on Zeno's one and built my argument for infinite descent, which defends, clarifies metaphysical possibility of infinite descent. I then tried and imagined some objections that the Eleatic might try to put forth to object to my, counter my argument. So the Eleatic might go with Coxon and try and deny premise one. However, there's significant textual evidence that Parmenides and Zeno did think of the one as extended, so this fails. Uh, the Eleatic might also go with Furley, so try and deny premise two. However, first of all, the historical legitimacy of the operation required to do so, that is, the comparison between Zeno and Melissus is highly controversial, even if it were in some serious difficulties of causal nature, for example, come up. So we, it seems that we are stuck with infinite descent, but as I argued a few seconds ago, that's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, 
infinite descent leads to a more ontologically democratic and egalitarian picture of reality. So in conclusion, I think I have attained both my objectives. This is all. Here's some bibliography and thank you so much. Ci tengo a ringraziare nuovamente il Collegio Chesieri per avermi dato la possibilità di presentare il mio lavoro e buona giornata.